Hey everybody, welcome back to DTC 392 uh, Video Game Histories and Theories. Today, we're going to be taking a look at... Uh... Drumroll, there it goes. Okay, thank goodness. We're going to be taking a look at some old school arcade games. Um, and of course, clearly... Like, I'm not playing the actual games. These are going to be emulated. So, I, you know, I think one one of the things that we could talk about is the difference between what I am doing and what, you know, the actual experience of playing these things back in the day, or, I mean, I guess even now, if you can find the machines, would be. Um, I've got several uh, loaded up here. Uh, most of them, I think, are pretty good emulations. There are some, particularly Space Invaders, is a little less than awesome. Um, well, anyway, we'll get to that as we get to it. So, yeah, let's jump in. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on any of these, and some probably less than others, because, well, I mean, just for a variety of reasons. I don't want to say they're bad, but, man, have video games come a long way since since back in the day. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking a lot. I think all of these, yeah, were, were heavily, well, maybe not heavily featured, but were at least mentioned in Donovan's chapter about, uh, well, his couple of chapters that we read for today about sort of the late 70s era, early 80s era of uh, video games, particularly, you know, as arcade games starting to bleed into that home console market, but still essentially sort of marketed as, those consoles were marketed as taking the arcade into your home, you know? Um which is completely different than what we're dealing with now. Uh, arcades are still a thing, clearly, um, but have lost a lot of the cultural uh, impact, we'll say. Let's try... Uh, no, let's not try that one. Apparently, let's try this one. At least in, at least in America, I should say that. Um, I don't want to claim uh, that all gaming cultures are the same okay so here we have it like this is here's breakout right um donovan describes it as being um i don't know not necessarily uh, uh I, I guess an iteration of pong right it's uh it's an attempt to make pong a single player game Still basically the same, you know, like you have a paddle and you hit a ball, but instead of bouncing it back and forth between another player and his paddle, uh, you have these these blocks. I should note too that uh, this is, this multicolored, technicolored if you will, version of Pong is actually, I think the Atari, I, th I see, I got it, yeah, the Atari VCS port from 1978, not the original arcade Pong. I'm sorry, Breakout. Um, because that was completely monochromic. Monochromatic? Mo it was monochrome. Black and white. Uh, okay. Here I am playing with my left and right. I can, I can, I can never really get this part to work. There we go. left and right buttons. Oof. This is going to be tough. Um, oops. Which is different in a lot of ways from the way that you would normally play it, which would be with um, a dial, I believe. Uh, sort of, you know, I mean, sort of like a radio dial, only vertical that you could move. Which is important to, to it's an important sort of thing to note because clearly uh, you can be a little bit more gosh dang it you can be a little bit more fine-tuning and fine-tuned in your movement with a dial instead of just you know holding down this there seems to be a little bit of a um, the, uh, absence of acceleration of, when you of, hold down the of, key this is really the worst working emulator uh, emulation that options I have. to play, but I mean, like, I'm trying to imagine, you know, being in an arcade and just like being amazed by this game and wanting to play it over and over and over again. Um, 
Oh no. The stream broke. Okay, so I was talking about uh, sort of how, how, how tedious this game is to play. Um, and how interesting it is to think of sort of refreshing work. Yeah, I'm sorry, you might just have to refresh. I, 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 I took steps I mentioned earlier um, to make this stream go a little bit better. And it's showing that my connection speed is good. And I have 0% dropped frame so far, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, you know, what we're doing the best we can, right? We're making do here. Uh, if it sucks, I, I really apologize, and we'll, we'll revisit the usefulness of these things. It does a lag spike. Okay. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah, we, we have some, uh, in chat, you know, people, people remembering playing these things. Um, I mean, yeah, and it's sort of, you know, uh, Man of Quinn mentions playing it on an old Nokia brick phone. Um, like, it does sort of have that casual game-esque feeling to it, where it's just sort of almost a distraction kind of game, you know? Not, not, not really an attraction to me. Clearly it was, though, back in the day. Uh, because this thing, I mean, I didn't, I didn't note how much money it made, but it made a shit ton of money. Um... So I mean, it, it, I mean, it attracted people into bars and into uh, arcades to play it. Um, but it is, I mean, it, you know, this game hates me. It's very simple, and it's very sort of, uh, you know, primitive a little bit. This is particularly primitive because. because the serve button doesn't really want to work for me despite there we go you just got to you just got to mash it but that's not to say that this game isn't you know technically impressive you know like it's got a nice physics to it um, I think, you know, as far as game flow goes, it does speed up if you're good enough to, you know, hit it three or four times in a row. I am not. Um, God darn it. Okay. So this originally came out in 1976, right? Influenced by Pong. Um, I believe the book states that it was Wozniak, Steve Wozniak of, of, you know, Apple fame. Oh, no. Everybody good? Am I still on? Uh, who designed it? But, uh, you know, to be honest, I would need to reread that because it might have just been the, uh, the port that he worked on. Um, okay. That's enough of that. Let's, let's move on to something else. Um, breakout is frustrating. I want to look at Atari Football, and I'm actually not going to play this because it is also really frustrating. Uh, but I think we can just kind of watch the uh, the attract mode, you know, that would be running uh, as it was waiting on players to come play. I've actually got this set up where it is vertical. Hold on, let's check this out. That's not what I want. Um, well, whatever. We'll leave it there. Um, originally, it is it's 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 horizontal, so that uh, you know you sort of have the length of the football. Uh, but you know, um, this was essentially played on a tabletop. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those arcade machines that are flat instead of standing upright. And they'll have a chair on both sides, and each each you know end has their own controls and whatnot. And so in this on this one, clearly you play as offense or you play as defense and and trade on and off. Um, you'll see over here on the the right hand side the the keeper. It says now you know that's that's how you that's how you pick your play the bomb and the down and out there's really there's really no indication what that play is as far as i could tell uh messing with this for a little bit but yeah like a skee-ball table a little bit um so it's like you just you, i guess you have to know uh, enough football to know that i mean clearly a bomb i think is going to be a pass um 
Yeah, he steps back and passes, and it looks like maybe that was going to get intercepted. I'm not really sure. Um, but you can definitely sort of imagine how, you know, this game would be played by two people sitting at a table. Um, not unlike, you know, skee-ball, right? Everybody good on stream? I still don't know. I have no idea what's going on. Um, because it's it's looking great on my end. You're good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, sorry, man. If you've got if you've got uh, if you've got lag spikes, try to refresh. I am recording, which might be causing this, but um, I'm thinking that you know, recording this in case the stream sucks is a good idea, so that I can just post it and we don't lose everything. Okay. Atari football, 1978. Two years after Breakout, also monochrome, you'll notice. Um, ah, and the interesting thing about this, again, going back to that idea of the materiality of the game, right, is that it was played with a trackball, which, you know, was something basically like a plastic uh, cue ball that, you know, was sort of seated inside uh, the frame that you would roll. Uh, and, of course, the, the harder you rolled it, the further you would pass. Um, so a little bit of, of, of interesting control there, which is something that we can't emulate here, right? I mean, somebody might have made uh, sort of, you know, a, a USB trackball. Well, I'm sure they actually, I mean, it, yeah, you could use like a trackball mouse, I suppose. Um, but still not quite the same, you know, feeling. Wow. Wow. All of his games with a trackball mouse. Yeah, that's that is that's hardcore. That's pretty crazy. I can't even work a website with a trackball mouse, so like just scrolling is hard. Okay. Let's get to some meat and potatoes. Let's look at Space Invaders. And I think actually this is the one that works the best. Or at all. Let me know how the sound goes, because I think this this sound might be a little bit loud and obnoxious sometimes. Space Invaders, also 1978. So that same, um, that same year that uh, Atari Football was made. Put in my quarter. And hit start. Okay. Let me hide for a second, sorry. Okay. We're not quite monochrome. We have a little bit of green, but all of the enemies are one color. That was that was the sound that I was worried about being really loud and obnoxious. So sorry if that scared you. Um, yeah, the thumb sounds. So yeah, I mean, so the designer, you know, uh, mentioned in the book, or Donovan mentioned in the book, that the, that the designer was going for this idea of a heartbeat, you know. Um, and I think it also sort of works, sort of as a drum of war, you know, the invading army. I think it's so loud and obnoxious. And you'll notice it speeds up as they get closer. I was doing so much better at this earlier this week when I was when I was playing for fun. Let's do it again. So I think one of the interesting things about sort of the change, I guess, I don't know, a shift in focus between older games and newer games is the idea of the high score, you know? Um, even though this is two-player, you would clearly not play together. Damn, missed him. Damn, wasn't paying attention. 
You wouldn't play together, you would swap off. You know, not unlike uh, Super Mario Brothers or something. But the goal here... I mean, of course, there is sort of that... Got him. There is this little bit of narrative built in the game where you are protecting sort of the Earth from the space invaders. Uh, but really, you know, the goal is high score. Um, there's there's no narrative goal, so to, sp so to speak, except for saying I saved the world, I suppose, sort of abstractly. Got him. No! No! So close. Okay. That, I mean, that was it, right? They're like, you know, there, was, there is this sort of, this neat um, little bit of the... Um, yeah, yeah, Shutter Cat's getting... It's that, that, that nice detail that, that moves faster and faster as they get closer. And, and they move faster and faster as you, as you, as you shoot them, right? Like, the, the fewer there are, the faster they go. So there is this really nice sort of uh, 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 speeding up of the mechanic. Uh, to make you feel, you know, like it's it gets back to that idea of that video games are are uh, affective, you know, like there's it's a it definitely sort of quickens your pulse and makes you sort of spaz out a little bit. Well, it makes me spaz out a little bit anyway. All right, let's. All right, I'm gonna play one more time uh, and then we'll move on. We're already in twenty twenty minutes. Uh, one of the things that I want to think about as as we're you know playing these games is to think about how how much iteration we see. Uh, you know, I mentioned that... Get it, nerds? Whole row. I mentioned that Breakout was essentially, you know, this this iteration, reiteration of Pong to make it a single-player game where somebody could play against a computer. Uh, and the next s couple of games we're going to look at... The next couple of games we are going to look at do that with this game, right? This was this was a, a smash success for uh, uh, oh I can't remember the name of the company off the head at the top of my head, Tatia maybe? Ta I don't know how to say it, and I can't I can't find it on my notes. But just briefly looking over. Shut up. Thank you. T A I T O. Tatio. Tiato? Tiato, probably, yeah? I don't know. Anyone who has any inkling about Japanese pronunciations can, can help us there uh, when we meet in a minute. I don't think Donovan actually, like, makes this claim, but uh, I get the impression that re through reading that chapter that I think we can really sort of point to this game as being the thing that really made video games a thing. You know, like, it seems in a lot of ways that they were distractions and sort of neat little toys that you would play. Uh, maybe not all that different than those sort of poker machines or that, like, the sort of what's the difference in these picture things that you might find at bars. Uh, that are just sort of there to pass the time while you're having a beer. Oh my god. Got him! And what do I get <laughs> just to start over again? No rest for the weary. Uh, but this game, you know, like, even though it is, I mean, very sparse on story, 
there's still sort of this implied story, right? And still sort of space for the, the player to enact being a hero in a lot of I mean, not in a lot of ways, in sort of a very basic way. Protecting... Oof. Protecting the world. Oh, man, I wasn't ready for that. Oh, well. Um, protecting the world from space invaders. Shuttercat says, Google says, Taito. I take it, right? Taito. Um, yeah, and I mean, and well, I don't want to say they're still around. I wouldn't be surprised if they were, but I know they were still making video games in uh, the 90s. Or maybe just late 80s. But, you know, Nintendo Super, Nintendo kind of era. Right? Well, yeah, uh, Cactar King, you bring up a really great point, right? That creating your own narrative. Not that that's not possible in things like Pong. Because it's, you know, it's sort of a sports metaphor. And sports already sort of have this, you know, uh, ability to embed narrative. Underdogs versus, you know, the Yankees kind of thing. Um, where do you see Bubble Bobble at? Um, but, yeah, you know, uh, I mean, you know, Breakout, you can you can sort of, you know, creatively ascri ascribe sort of a narrative to it. But Space Invaders, it's really sort of, it's, it's I mean, it's like right there in the, in the title and in the, and in the, in the aesthetics of the game itself, you know, it really lends itself well to that. Um, okay, so let's, we're going to take a look at, um, oh, sorry, I've got a note here too, Space Invaders itself was inspired by Breakout, and you can totally see the sort of, the sort of idea there, right? You know, you're shooting a ball, and it, and it breaks the thing uh, to get at the, the, the ones behind it. Uh, so we have that, we have that sort of reiteration of, of a similar idea there, too. Pong to Breakout to Space Invaders. All right, let's check out Asteroids. Asteroids might look a, 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 a very similar to you if you watched that thing on Space War, right? Because it is sort of this idea uh, taking Space War and making it a, a, a one-player video game. Um, it was played on a vector monitor, hence the line art. I have one button for shooting, and I have another button for thrust. Oops. And the game space is recursive, I think is the right use of that term, right? Like, it's, um, maybe that's not the right term, but, like, continuous, anyway. Uh, I, I exit out of the right, and I come into the left, or from the bottom to the top. It is missing that you know, sort of gravitational pull uh, in the center of the screen that Space War had. But it adds... Damn. It does add dodging the asteroids to gameplay to make it a lot more dynamic. And again, you know, like, really? It's sort of about uh, staying alive and racking up as many points as you can. Oof, I'm terrible. Your score is one of the of the ten best. I'm amazing at this game. I gotta find the button that works. Alright, put another coin. Press start. I think we can also start thinking about, and I think arcade games are really useful way to start thinking about games like this, but as, you know, um, economic, you know, commercial business ventures, right? This is, this is designed not only to be fun and sort of in and of itself, uh, you know, being artistic or whatever, but it's, it's really essentially designed to, to cost money, to, to rake in quarters. All of these games are. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, that, that has to, that has to play into 
design decisions, you know? Do you make it, if you make it too hard, then nobody's gonna keep putting quarters in. If you make it too easy, then, uh, you know, somebody can beat it on a quarter. I think maybe even the idea of having... Damn. Uh, I think even the idea of having high scores and, and, and inviting that sort of competition between friends or, or at least, you know, patrons at a bar. Damn. I think I still got points even though I exploded. Okay. We're going to move pretty quickly from that one too because... Um, because they get better, believe it or not, as, as you as you go through as you go through time, uh, video games get so much better. Um, cool, yeah. Uh, Starry Ari uh, says that they really like the difference between the raster graphics and the vector graphics and how that produces smoother gameplay. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I didn't really even think about it as in terms of like the smoothment, uh, smoothness of the movement, but but I mean, yeah, you know, the the, the feeling of of piloting your asteroid ship feels, uh, well, a lot different than than sort of piloting your breakout uh, paddle or whatever platform. Um, and there's also this feeling, uh, particularly in asteroids, of a physics, you know, like. Um, Astro I mean, a Breakout had it a little bit too, but honestly, I think, honestly, I think it's probably a little bit of a uh, uh, emulation thing. Um, but you know, feeling like it sort of takes a minute to get going if you if you really hold down the thruster button, uh, and then sort of takes off pretty quickly, you know, um, and that can get you in trouble because a there's not a lot of places to go, and and b there's probably a giant rock in the way at some point. All right, let's check out Galaxian. Right, yeah. Uh, Dylan, Eric Steen. Similar to Spice where the vector display is more similar to a radar screen. I think there's something to that. I, I think you're right, yeah. And I think, you know, maybe maybe the thing about that is, I mean, cl clearly we've got that, that um, military technology connection, right? But I think also, you know, it helps particularly maybe at the time make it feel more real, you know? Uh, sort of this, um, clearly it's not photorealistic, but if we can imagine that we are piloting something and looking at it through a radar screen, then that sort of provides this, this sort of connection to the real world that makes it feel more real. Yeah, I like that. sort of a realness through hypermediation. Okay. I think you'll be able to pretty clearly see the inspiration for Galaga. This one, this one is probably the one that I played the most out of all of the ones that we're gonna look at today. Um, I can safely say I've never played an original Space Invaders machine. Damn. But I've definitely played some uh, Galaga and uh, Galaxia. But it clearly, I mean, owes a whole lot to Space Invaders. And we can sort of see, you know, um, we can infer this desire 
for more difficult games uh, than Space Invaders. You know, Space Invaders came uh, on the scene and everybody loved it. And then it's kind of like, okay, well, now what? Well, let's up the challenge, you know? Uh, there's not any shields at the bottom to hide behind. And they dive bomb you, for, for goodness sakes. You know, not just shoot... Well, they shoot at you, for one. And they dive bomb at you. We are the Galaxians. Like Space Invaders, they, you know, give you different sets of points for the different, um, I don't know, convoys, I suppose we could call them. The different, the different enemy types. Uh, yeah, again, okay. Namco. This came out in 1979 in Japan and 1980 in the U.S. So, uh, you know, just one or two years after Space Invaders. So a pretty quick turnaround, you know. Uh, to be inspired by a game and then completely sort of reinvented at the same time. I wanted to beat one stage, but I don't know if it's going to have to... I don't know if we can do this. Uh, aye, cool. So, uh, yeah, Galaga was one of your first games. That's so rad. I, I think it was easily one of my first arcade games. Like, like for the longest time, this is what I thought of when I thought of arcade games. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the history is and the relationship between Galaga and Galaxian, but I think they are sort of cousins. Do you know what I mean? Like, even more so than, say, uh, Space Invaders and these kind of games. Yeah, Galaga was, was the shit. But I think I think Galaga came out of Galaxian, like, as a sort of pseudo-sequel or some shit. Um... <laughs> Bruh. Uh... Why does it look like their bullets are teleporting sometimes? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It could be... It could be an artifact of the emulator, or it could be an emulated artifact of the actual, you know, uh, arcade machine. Uh, using, like, CRT television monitors, uh, where, you know, the, the image is refreshed so many times every second, and so there's, there's liable to be that sort of jump. Uh, that's a great question, though, and I think I think we'd really have to like. I, I don't think we can answer that question without getting into sort of the meta conversation about what is emulated and what's not emulated, you know. But that's a. I mean, I think what I would say is if that is an artifact that came from the original, it was probably because of the CRT uh, issues. Okay, Galaxian, right. Reiteration of Space Invaders, one of the first to feature RGB colors, which we which we noted like right off the bat, right? Like those 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 stars. Imagine imagine a world of monochromic, or or at the most, you know, you have two colors of video games, and then you're walking by one, and it's got those it's got those you know purple and and blue and green uh, star, uh, stars there. It's it's gonna draw you in. Not to mention continuous sound, right? Most of these at the best have that sort of that that droning womp 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 sound, but this is you know like uh, dynamic, almost sort of chaotic. Uh, sounds like a war zone, maybe. Okay, I want to look at Defender, sort of as as uh, our last sort of. I mean, certainly not the last, but the last one we're going to look at today, of the lineage of 
uh, Space Invaders slash Breakout, if break if we want to, you know, I mean, like, I guess we could tie all of these back to Breakout, because they're all tied to Space Invaders, and Space Invaders was in fucking inspired by... Sorry, hold on. Okay, so... Defenders by Williams Electronics. Uh, this is the first American game we've looked at since Atari Football. So, uh, you know, Breakout and Atari, I mean, Atari Football, were both from Atari. Oh, no, I, I take that back. Sorry, Asteroids was also from Atari. Uh, but Space Invaders, Galaxian, those were both Japanese video games. Okay. Put in my quarter. Good start. That was quick. <laughs> Defender was notable for having more buttons than, than the other games. Oh no, I destroyed a human. I destroyed an astronaut. I'm terrible at this game. This was also sort of... This was like the Dark Souls of the 1980s, right? Like, 81. It's, this was this game was made to be difficult. Uh, and was sort of celebrated for the difficulty. I'm saying that so that you don't think I'm... Absolute garbage playing video games. Even though I might be. Uh, this one's particularly difficult. And I'm very not good at it. Uh, I've never played this game before. This is just sort of this week is the first I've ever played Defender, believe it or not. Um, I've certainly seen the machines. I think, well, I was going to say there's one here, but I now remember that you're not here, so that's that's moot. Uh, but I think we have one in our little barcade in Milwaukee, actually. Um, they're not terribly rare to see, I'll say. The idea here, of course, is again that I am defending uh, some sort of terrestrial plane from aliens, and you can see the little, the little that look like little jokers with the purple suits and the green hair. Uh, I think those are supposed to be astronauts, and they'll get sucked up by the aliens and taken into space, and I get points if I can protect them. Which generally just means hitting them with my ship, luckily. I don't have to do anything special. Um, I've got a booster. Speaking of controls, I've got a... Oh, they turn into enemies, thanks, yeah. Uh, I've got a booster to make me go faster. I've got my shot, clearly. But I've also got this thing that they call turbo, or boost, maybe. Uh, which turns me around, puts me on the other side of the screen, and I can, and then I can then go from right to left instead of left to right. I'm gonna mess on this one more playthrough because I'm clearly not doing very well. Damn. Um, but again, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty amazed at the amount of color and detail in this. Like, that ship, that ship is just a rainbow... Look at that, it's crazy. Like, not only the booster effects, but like what whatever is going on. There's like a disco going on in the in the cabin. It's no wonder that I can't do anything, because I've got I've got rainbow lights in my eyes. Oh, oh, oh! Wrong button. Okay. Yeah, I think that speaks for itself. Let's move on. Oh, I feel like I'm, I just missed something. In chat. Uh, I can't, I can't scroll up. Hold on just a second. Yeah, the scrolling camera, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Save the humans. The firing sound. Yeah, so, I mean, like, yeah, we're really sort of getting at the, the, you know, I don't want to say crunchiness, but, you know, the, 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 the juiciness of, of the AV aspects of video games. 
uh, in those really late 80s, really early, I mean, sorry, really late 70s, really early video games. Um, you know, I can't really say Space Invaders is terribly satisfying as far as sound and feeling goes or whatever, but uh, Galaxian and Defender, for sure, um, definitely have that sort of punch to them. Okay. So, if Space Invaders was the thing that sort of put video games on the map, so to speak, sort of, you know, maybe outside of... Uh, you know, the teenage kids or or whatever that, that would have found them anyway. Pac-Man is the thing that really made it um, a global phenomenon. Like, mainstream kind of thing, right? Um, I was actually maybe thinking about showing you the um, cartoon theme song intro. Uh, because it had its own cartoon. That's how big this was. This is, and, you know, this is going to be... Oh, I was going to say it's the first time you're going to hear some intro music, but that's not quite true. But it is sort of the most memorable one, maybe. How, how good is that? And of course, this is usually played, originally played with a joystick on bone. Nope, oh, okay. Which might, I don't, I mean, I grew up playing this on um, an Apple II computer, if you can believe it. Uh, so I'm used to playing it with, you know, the up, down, left, right keys. I actually find it incredibly difficult when I find this in, a, in an arcade to play it with the joystick, just because it doesn't, I don't know, it's not quite as um, articulate, I suppose. I got myself into trouble. First cutscene? Might that have been the first cutscene? I have to admit that I'm uh, I'm more familiar with Mrs. Pac-Man than I am Pac-Man Pac-Man. Um, that was the one that I played on the Apple II in my mom's office. Um, and I knew it had some cutscenes, and for some reason I was thinking it was the first game that had cutscenes, but I guess, I guess, uh, original Puck Man did too. Oh, I was boned. Alright, um, yeah, I can't remember all of their names. Uh, obviously I'm playing, the, the only one that I could find to work was, uh, was an emulation of the Japanese game, so it's got the Japanese names for the ghost. But yeah, one's Blinky, one's Pinky. I bet you can guess which one's name is Pinky. Um, maybe Stinky? I don't know. 
<laughs> you idiot ghosts. I just went around. Um. Okay, yeah. Namco. This is created by Toro. Iwatani. That's probably not how you say it. Um. And I, what, I th what I find interesting is, and, and what we'll talk about in a few weeks is, um, in more detail, is that Pac-Man was an attempt to draw game girls, females, women, into gaming. Um, you know, it's not, you don't shoot anything. Um, even if his sort of, <laughs> even if his sort of reasoning and ideas sort of sound a little sexist, you know? He was like, uh, what are girls like? I don't know, eating? Um, the idea that, you know, you're trying to expand the audience, I think, is, is clearly really important and clearly paid off quite well for him and uh, the parent company, Namco. Ooh, hello. Um, I mean, because why, why limit yourself to taking quarters from dudes when you can also take them from chicks? Ah. In their thinking, that's, yeah, I don't know. In their, in their parlance. Oh yeah, Clyde is one too, for sure. Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. Aren't there five ghosts though? One, two, three, four. Oh, no, I guess not. Inky, Binky, Pinky, and Clyde. Okay. And that's Pac-Man. Or, or Puck-Man, I guess, as it was originally called in uh, Japan. I think I do want to pull up really quickly... We'll use this one. Uh, for those of you that got here a little late, we were we were jamming out to some Ronnie James video games. Um, actually, I think I have this. A well, let's see. Um, Pac-Man cartoon theme. What do you know? Um, it just sort of it blows my mind that. Oh, I guess it doesn't. I mean, Pac-Man was a big deal, but. You know, to take what we just saw and narrativize it in such a way that you could make a cartoon out of it sort of blows my mind. All right, so here is the introduction to the Saturday morning cartoon Pac-Man. Pac-Man. That's me. Pac-Man. Who is this dude? So I think, you know, oh shoot. That's gonna just keep playing in it, in it. What I really think is interesting about that is we've been talking a lot about how um, is the baby a power pound? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they planned on making a Pac-Man Jr., which maybe they did actually. Um, but clearly that was Mrs. Pac-Man, and I guess you know if you have a if you have a Pac-Man and a Mrs. Pac-Man and not Pac-Woman, weirdly, um, you're gonna have baby Pac-Mans, I suppose. Sorry. The, the 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 smart idea that I had uh, while we were watching that is what I think is really interesting about this sort of this weird sort of let's make a cartoon out of this video game is that you know we've been talking about how uh, video games came out of this technology of the of TVs right the proliferation of TVs entering the homes right uh, and it's sort of you know you you could almost think of it as being sort of a child of television in a in a lot of ways right it's sort of coming up. Uh, after uh, film and television and whatnot, and sort of this this newborn thing, it's it's the baby Pac-Man. But then here we have a cartoon that is then remediating the video game. You know, it's it's uh, it's television sort of looking back and being like, oh no, this is this is the thing. Let's do this. And so you have this sort of this 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 medium in its infancy. Then starting to get popular and starting to starting to uh, influence mediums that are a little bit more established. Not that tech, not that television has been around for a whole long time at this point, you know. Um, particularly sort of widely available, but I still think it's a pretty interesting um, thing. And I would be I, I'd be 
curious to know if it was the first instance of sort of a video game um, adaptation for television. I don't know. That would be something worth. That would be something worth um, researching. Back woman was her maiden name. <laughs> she was thinking about hyphenating it into. <laughs> but no, never mind. That's a dumb joke. But you get it. A lot of hyphenations. Um, right, no, yeah, there were a ton, but this was the first, and it was very early on, right? Like, I mean, uh, you know, like Pac Man was really the first sort of major sort of, uh, you know, outside of the people who are already interested in gaming. Pac Man is the first sort of franchise or whatever, the first game that really started taking over mainstream culture. Um,. And the fact, the fact that it happened, speaking sort of relatively, you know, like almost immediately out of the gate, there was a video game that happened and it was huge and everybody loved it. And it's, and it spawned all of these different sort of iterations and, um, uh, adaptations. Okay. Let's, um, let's take about a 10 minute break and we will reconvene for discussion and stuff, uh, on Zoom, if that sounds good. Um, thanks everybody for, for coming in and, uh, lighten up chat. This is great. I'm going to have a lot of time reading over this. Um, sadly I've missed so much already. Um, ah, okay. Well actually Shuttercat has something interesting about Pac-Man. Highest grossing American arcade game of all time. Mrs. Pac-Man was a major title on her own. The game moved 125,000 arcade cabinets, and by 87, it pulled in over $1.2 billion in quarters. Oh, my God. By one estimate, it's the fourth highest-selling arcade game of all time. That is... Bananas. Oh, uh, my Legend of Zelda cartoon joke. I love it. Um... Uh, the link doesn't work. The link on, uh, 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 uh... Basecamp should work. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think so. This should be that should still be it. If it doesn't, I will send out uh, another email with the Zoom link. Um, just give me a minute. I'm gonna go get some more water, and I'll be right back. Okay, I'll see you all there. If it doesn't work, just just hang tight, and I'll send out an email. All right. See you in a minute. 